It's a wonderful day. I'm happy to be here to give this devotional today on my birthday. And I hope that my message will touch some of you in the audience. That would be a wonderful birthday present for me. Now, I have a confession. I have been wondering whether I should admit this to such a large crowd. But here we go. My confession is that I love mathematics. <laughs> I know that for some of you, the word math brings a flood of bad memories. So before you get up to leave, let me share with you a different way to see math. Unfortunately, many people have the mistaken image that math is just a set of rules and calculations. That is not math. My family and I love the NCAA March Madness basketball tournament, sitting around with friends and watching an underdog team beat a highly favored team with a last second desperation shot is exciting. Compare such a thrilling basketball game to being alone in a gym, shooting hundreds and hundreds of free throws. If all I ever did were to shoot free throws over and over all by myself and never play or watch a real game of basketball, I wouldn't like basketball. The same is true of math. Doing endless math drills is like shooting free throws over and over. It's not mathematics. To me, math can be like a game of strategy, such as Settlers of Catan. Once you know the rules of the game, you can explore where the game will take you. In some ways, and you'll have to work with me on this one, in some ways, math is like genealogy. You have several family lines you work on, and you may get stuck. But then a new piece of information opens up a previously blocked line. You get excited, and new results are uncovered. The exact same thing happens with mathematics. You could be working at the Disney Research Group using math to create realis realistic looking hair in the movie Moana. Or you could be designing a new method for Netflix to determine what movie a subscriber would like. Or you could even be working on an abstract math problem that uncovers new results, such as finding a fast algorithm to determine whether or not a number is prime. This is how I see mathematics and why I love it. To me, mathematics is beautiful. Now, the world has many beautiful things. Watching a rising full moon peeking over the Wasatch Mountains on a dark winter night, like this past weekend. Sitting outside on a New Hampshire fall evening, savoring poetry by Robert Frost. Listening to the Vienna Philharmonic perform Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in the 150-year-old neoclassical Wiener Musikverein concert hall. All of these things are beautiful to me. Likewise, mathematics is beautiful. Now, some of you may think I'm crazy. Remember, when I think of math, I'm not talking about those endless drills that you probably did in high school. When people ask me what research I do, I say I study the math of soap bubbles. Actually, these are soap films that are formed by dipping wires or frames in a bucket of soapy water. To me, these soap films are fascinating. The shapes they take, the way they reflect light, their fragile nature, they relate to mathematical shapes known as minimal surfaces. Here are some examples. There is a harmony between the shapes soap films take in nature and the mathematics behind minimal surfaces. I study the mathematics re related to this, to this, and I find it beautiful. I encourage you to explore how mathematics is different than a set of rules and calculations. In much the same way that I hope you will begin to see mathematics in a different and positive way, I want my students to see me as their professor in a different and positive way. Some students are afraid of their professors. On the first day of the semester, I tell my students uh, how, excuse me, <laughs> I tell my class, the students often ask, how should they address me? Should they call me Professor Dorf 
or Dr. Dorf or Brother Dorf. When I tell them that I want them to call me Coach Dorf, they look a bit puzzled. I tell them that I want them to see me as their math coach, someone who's there to guide them and help them succeed, just like a sports coach would do. I want them to see me not as someone who's trying to fail them, but instead as someone who's trying to help them succeed. I want them to see me differently. In addition to seeing mathematics and my role as a professor differently, I think of Christmas differently. If you talk with my students, you, they will probably tell you that Coach Dorf loves Christmas. I look forward to Christmas and I mention it occasionally when I teach my classes in the fall. Okay, perhaps more than occasionally. Some people say you shouldn't talk about Christmas or listen to Christmas music until after Thanksgiving. That may, <laughs> that may be true. But that is looking at Christmas as only a specific date, December 25th. I like to think of Christmas not as a date, but as a way of thinking or as a state of mind. Christmas to me is remembering Jesus Christ, his birth and the gift of eternal life. Christmas to me is remembering how we should treat the people we interact with, whether they be our family, our friends or strangers, whether they have the same beliefs or different beliefs than we do whether they look like us or look different than us. I experienced this Christmas state of mind a few years ago at Jackson State University in Mississippi. The university was opening a new center for undergraduate research. Now let me interject here. When I teach, I often give commercial breaks. This is a chance for Coach Dorf to give fatherly advice to the students. This is a commercial break. If you're a BYU student, you should do undergraduate research. Undergraduate research has been shown to help you do better as in college and more, be more successful after you graduate. And BYU is a wonderful place to do undergraduate research. I encourage all students to do undergraduate research. Okay, now back to the regular program. So I was, um, the university, uh, Jackson State University, was opening a new center for undergraduate research and I was invited to give some talks to the faculty and students. At Jackson State University is an HBCU, Historically Black Colleges and Universities. Over 90% of the students are African American, African American. During my visit, the university was inaugurating a new president, and I attended the ceremony along with the Jackson State faculty and staff. During the ceremony, I was introduced and asked to stand. As I did so, I could see the entire audience, and it was apparent that I was one of the very few Caucasians in the group. I have to admit, I felt a bit out of place. Are there times when you have felt out of place, like you're not sure you belong? Or are there times when you do not feel out of place, but there may be others in the audience who might feel that they do not belong? What can you do in such situations? After the inauguration ceremony at Jackson State and throughout my visit there, I felt at ease because of how the faculty and students went out of their way to meet me, to talk with me, and to be friendly to me. That experience reminds me to think about how I treat people who may feel out of place, who may be lonely, or who may be different than me. The importance of how we treat people is a recurring theme in the gospel of Jesus Christ. President Russell M. Nelson remarked, today we have a little more time to bless others, time to be kinder, more compassionate, quicker to thank, and slower to scold, more generous in sharing, more gracious in caring. This is embodied in the story of the Good Samaritan, who went out of his way to help a stranger who had fallen among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed him, departed, leaving him half dead, while other people who saw the stranger passed by on the other side and did not help him. Despite the historical antagonism between the Samaritans and the Jews, the good Samaritan treated this Jewish stranger with kindness. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 through 36, we read, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. 
I was a stranger and you took me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Who are the people around us who hunger or who thirst or who are strangers? At first we may think of the people who hunger for food. There are also people who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Are there other ways that people hunger? What about those who hunger for someone to listen to them, who hunger for friendship, who hunger for encouragement, who hunger for respect, who hunger for compassion? Treating people with kindness is easier in theory than in practice. During Christmas, of course I had to mention Christmas again, my family and I saw the movie Wonder. The movie made such an impact on me that I read the book afterwards. Wonder is the story of a 10-year-old boy, August Pullman, or Augie, who is anxious because he's entering fifth grade in a new school. There are two things that make Augie different than the other school children. Up to now, he has been homeschooled by his mother. And Augie has a medical condition that makes his face look different. So much so that some people stare at him and some kids run away screaming when they see him. The story is about how, at first, most of his classmates treat him as if he has a contagious disease. They avoid him. They think he is a freak, and some bully him. But as his classmates slowly get over their initial prejudice, they begin to see that he is a funny, smart, and fairly normal fifth grade boy. At the end of the year graduation ceremony, the Henry Ward Beecher Medal is given. Mr. Tushman, the director of the school, says, courage, kindness, friendship, character. These are the qualities that define us as human beings and propel us on occasion to greatness. And that is what the Henry Ward Beecher Medal is about, recognizing greatness. The medal goes to Augie. During the ceremony, Mr. Tushman quotes J.M. Barry. Shall we make a new rule of life? Always try to be a little kinder than is necessary. What does it mean to be a little kinder than is necessary? Many of us are good at being kind to others, especially in circumstances when we feel good. But it's harder to be kind when you haven't slept well for several nights, or when you're feeling sick, or when you're stressed because of financial problems or when you've procrastinated doing something important, such as writing that six-page paper for your class, or finishing a presentation, perhaps even finishing a devotional talk. Also, it is harder to be kind, not to mention kinder than is necessary, to others when they act, look, or think differently than we do. However, Christ's teaching on the Sermon of the Mount invites us to do just that. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hurt you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I think this last scripture suggests the need to go beyond just treating people with kindness. It hints at the importance of seeing people differently. President Thomas S. Monson declared, we must develop the capacity to see men not as they are at present, but as they may become. <clears throat> Elder Jeffrey R. Holland summarized a comparable idea by C.S. Lewis when he, when he wrote, C.S. Lewis once said that if we could recognize who we were, we would realize that we are walking with possible gods and goddesses whom, if we could see them in their eternal dignity and glory, we would be tempted to fall down and worship. Because this is true, we need to think more highly of ourselves and we need to think more highly of each other. The vision of others, this vision of others is exemplified in the story about the four sons of Mosiah who traveled to the Lamanites to preach the gospel to them. They did this even though the Lamanites were the enemies of the Nephites and fought against them. They did this even though other Nephites laughed at them for thinking that the Lamanites could or would even want to change. 
In fact, the other Nephites responded, let us take up arms against them, that we destroy them and their iniquity out of the land, lest they overrun us and destroy us. The Lamanites were different than the Nephites, yet the four sons of Mosiah saw the Lamanites differently than the other Nephites saw them. And consequently, the sons of Mosiah treated the Lamanites with compassion. For me, seeing people in this way is more difficult than treating people a little kinder than is necessary. However, as I try to see people differently, it seems to follow that I treat them with more kindness. Unlike Augie in the story Wonder, most people's appearances does not suggest that they might be different or that they are in need of something. For example, I have been a type 1 diabetic for 45 years. That means that my body does not produce insulin, which is necessary to get energy from the food I eat. To compensate, I have to take a shot almost every time I eat. I have calculated, I'm a math nerd, remember, I have calculated that I have taken about 100,000 shots in my life. My, my health revolves around balancing medicine, diet, and exercise. If one of these components is off, my blood sugar could get very low, so low that I could go unconscious and fall down. When I have low blood sugar, most people will not know. There are few visible signs that this is happening. I look fairly normal, but I am in need of help. I am grateful for the, for the kindness and patience of those who have helped me in these situations. And fortunately, such low blood sugars rarely happen to me. Another example of seeing or not seeing someone differently happened last semester. I taught two classes of Math 112, Calculus 1, with a total of 494 students. Three times a week I had office hours to answer questions that students had about concepts of calculus and about the homework problems. In my office, I keep a bowl on my desk with about a dozen different flavors of lint chocolate truffles. Kind of ironic for a diabetic. It is amazing how helpful chocolate is in getting people to drop by your office and in making them feel more comfortable talking. After visiting me several times during office hours, students would often tell me about their missions or their families, and I enjoyed learning more about my students. I had one student who regularly visited me during my office hours. Sometimes she would be the only student to show up. Her name was Julia. She was not very talkative, but would ask me one or two specific questions and then leave. During the semester, I never felt like I got to know Julia as well as I had gotten to know other students. With Julia's permission, I want to tell part of her story. On New Year's Eve, Julia sent me an email. Coach Dorf, I just wanted to thank you for the great semester. This is the first time I've ever understood math in my life. I struggled in high school, then got cancer. Coming to BYU, I was extremely apprehensive about taking my first calculus class. I was just told that my cancer metastasized, and to get, treat, to get treated, I must stay in California for the next few months. My heart sank as I read Julia's email. I had no idea she had cancer. There were no outward signs that I had noticed. I expect few students knew that one of their classmates had cancer. As we try to see people differently, it's important to be kind and treat them a little kinder than is necessary because we do not know what's going on in their lives. People do not wear a sign hanging from their neck displaying their current struggles. No one is wearing a sign that declares, I'm scared I'm going to fail my math class, or I had a fight with my best friend, or my mother passed away yesterday, or I'm having a low blood sugar reaction, or even I have cancer. If we knew these things, would we see people differently would we treat them differently? The Holy Ghost can guide us to see people differently and to help those with unseen needs. After I earned my undergraduate degree, my wife Sarah, our young daughter Rebecca, and I moved to Nuremberg, Germany, where I taught high school math and English. I did not serve a German-speaking mission, but I did have a minor from BYU in German. We attended a small German-speaking congregation of the church. 
I was assigned by a church leader to periodically visit some members of the congregation. One was Michael. He had not attended church for several years, and some members, of the, some members had told me that Michael would not come back to church. I called him one day and asked if I could visit him and his family in their home. Michael said that he was really busy and that he did not want me to visit him now, but in six months I could call him again. So I left it at that. Later, one Saturday afternoon, I had some free time and I thought that a nap would be nice. I laid down on the bed and tried to sleep, but a thought came to my mind, go visit Michael. I thought, I can't do that. He said, don't visit him. I tried to fall asleep, but the thought that I should visit him did not leave. So I got up from my bed, and as I drove to the address for their house, I tried to figure out what I could say. I arrived at their address. It was an, an apartment complex with several floors. Such buildings had a locked front door. You had to ring a buzzer to the apartment you wanted to visit. The residents would ask who it was, and if they wanted to, they would let you into the building. When I arrived at the front door, it was open. I rang the buzzer to my, Michael's place and then started climbing the stairs to the top floor apartment. When I got there, the front door was open. A man was standing there. It was Michael. He introduced my, I introduced myself and told him I was from the church. He invited me in and I met his wife. He said that they had just had a fight and had decided to get a divorce. Now I'm a math nerd, and I'm not the best talker, especially not in German, but I can listen, and that's what I did. At the end, I wasn't sure what to say, but I told them that coming back to church would help them. They did start attending church, somewhat to the surprise of some of the members of the congregation. And when my family and I left Germany two years later, they were still attending and still married. The Holy Ghost helped me to see this German family in a different way, and that blessed both them and me. One last example of how seeing something differently blesses our lives and the lives of those around us. I did not grow up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My mother was Irish Catholic, and we attended Catholic, Catholic Mass regularly. I was even an altar boy, which means I assisted the Catholic, the Catholic priest during the Mass. When I was 16 years old, I was interested in learning about other churches. During the summer, I was playing cello in an orchestra and met a violinist, April Meads Moriarty. She and her family were LDS. They gave me a copy of the Book of Mormon. I read it in about 10 days, started attending sacrament meeting and taking the missionary discussions, and was soon converted. My mother was not happy about this. But instead of telling me that I could not talk with the missionaries, she decided to meet with them too, in order to point out their mistakes. She was soon converted. <laughs> when my older brother David was home from Harvard, we gave him a copy of the Book of Mormon and asked him to read it. He said he would. A while after he returned to college, we were talking with David on the phone. I asked him if he had read the Book of Mormon. He said he had. And he said it was not true. I was shocked. After that, the topic of the LDS Church did not come up much in our phone conversations with David. The following spring, we were planning to travel to Boston for David's graduation. One day, we were talking with him about our itinerary while visiting him. My mother told him that we wanted to attend the LDS Church on Sunday. David said that he would attend with us and then afterwards, he wanted me to baptize him. Again, I was shocked. As we talked, he explained what had happened. He said that he had read the Book of Mormon because he told me that he would read it. He wanted to prove that it was not true. After telling me that it was not true, he thought that his brother, me, would not do something dumb. Sounds like a comment from a brother. So he decided to read the Book of Mormon a second time. This time he read it differently, and that is when he gained a testimony of its truthfulness. 
Seeing the Book of Mormon differently has blessed David's life, life as well as many in his circle of influence. I encourage you to see things in a different and positive way, whether it is mathematics, Christmas, the Book of Mormon, or the people you meet in your daily lives. Our Savior Jesus Christ sees us differently, not as we currently are, but as we may become. I am awed by the love he has for me, who does not deserve it, and for the love he has for all of us, no matter who we are, no matter how different we may be from those around us, and no matter what struggles we have in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.